another day of narcotics. <laughs> and, uh, at 5.40 on a Thursday afternoon, I say I'm by myself at this point, but I know people will be hopping on. We're still getting used to this idea of, you know, going remote, what time do we meet, all those kind of things. Hello, as you come in, please uh, just put your name down so that I might be able to go ahead and mark you as present. Um, and I just want to say, hey, welcome. I'm glad you're here. Uh, erase the confusions from your mind, and let's just go ahead and chill and move through the semester as a group. We'll be fine. Hey, Chris, Margalita. I love the name Margalita. I'm not even going to lie to you. I love that name. So wel welcome to this evening's class. I'm just uh, pulling out my, uh, here we go. Oh, hey, Ashley, what's up? What's up? What's up? Let's see here. I'm glad to see you can make it. Rodriguez. Some of you are or are not in the uh, class, so I don't know. We'll figure all that out later. Chris, and we got you. Ashley, I know who you are. I actually know you, and that's something. I'm Margalita Sampson. I'll tell you what, I just, there was a Sampson Lounge at Denison where I attended college, so, you know, when I think of you and I think of your name, I always think of going back to Denison, you know what I'm saying? So, in any case, I hope you all are having a great week. Oh my God, it's just like, we're winding down, and <laughs> I'm not even gonna lie, I'm ready for the weekend. Um, I have to apologize if you tried to text me here recently. Uh, my phone got blown up to such a degree that I can't even look at it without tears in my eyes, baby. My, my face starts swelling, my lips start trembling, and next thing you know, I'm looking at that phone saying, oh, hey, Roxana. Oh, I'm just sitting there saying, oh my God, what else? What else could possibly go on on this, uh, on this particular day? Roxana, all right, good to see you. You know, and, and part of the is issue is, and I'm just gonna kick it off right from the beginning, is that every, so many of you have, uh, it's been laced with questions and confusion this semester to this point. Oh, seven people keep keep clocking in. Oh, Melanie, hey, what's going on? What's going on? Now, I know you. I know you. What is going on? It just seems like none of you are on this list, but I got you. I'm not even worried about it. Tatiana Jojos. Here we go. Now, that's a name. I like that name. Oh, what is going on here? Edgar Lopez. Edgar, what's happening? Um... Aria Rosa. Beautiful, beautiful. Let's see here. I don't know. I don't even know who's in this class, uh, given the names that are coming in, but I sure am glad you're here. Uh, let me just say uh, real quick, I'm going to make this class as simple as I can possibly make it this evening, all right? As simply as I can make it. And you may want to take notes. You may not. That's fine. Every assignment that is due for my classes, Every single assignment is due on a Tuesday night at um, 11.59. So if I take a look at your particular schedule and your particular class, your next paper is due next Tuesday at 11.59, right? And that paper is, if you go into your syllabus, that's where, man, live in that baby. Even if it confuses you, live in it. And the thing that you want to live in is the uh, course calendar. That's where all the magic is, because the course calendar will tell you, if you go down the right-hand margin, exactly what is due in which week, which is always Tuesday, and then on the left-hand margin, it tells you um, which day we're going to go live stream like we are today. So um, just keep looking at that. that. That is the most important one. And then if you take a look at as you sign in, please give me your name. Um, and if you take a look through the syllabus, you're going to see that the assignments are, in fact, described. So make sure that you read through it. It's not, not that big a deal. Live streams. The live streams will be held, at, and I see you're here, so it's not that big a deal. But the live streams will be held as um, defined by the original class um, schedule that you had. So you see that we're here at uh, 540 on Thursday afternoon. So we'll be back here in two weeks. Um, next week, I'll, I'll give you a video, something to catch you up, maybe explain the assignment just a little bit. Um, but I, I'm going to work really, I'm working really hard to try to keep you all abreast of everything that's uh, developing so that there's no surprises or what have you. But know that syllabus, go through those announcements. I haven't made an announcement in a few days because I haven't really had much to say. Um, the next announcement is going to be just basically what I did um, articulate, and that is everything's due on Tuesday at 11.59 p.m. in the week that it's due. The live streams are 5.40 every other Thursday. I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know how to make it any easier than that. The explanations for the assignment are in the syllabus, um, but I do suggest I do suggest 
that all of you and all of you go through that little miniature video I have I think it's either six or eight minutes long and the video is called and this is one of the announcements it's called how to write a great paper now Ashley you lead the way and let them know that if you follow that video you're gonna become an excellent writer right now you're still trying to get a feel for what I'm all about you're trying to get a feel forget all that baby forget all that here's what I'm about I'm gonna be real simple I am all about you finding your way I'm all about you finding yourself and all these assignments are designed to do essentially is to take you from where you are today and try to take you to the place where you want to be tomorrow that's all I'm doing I am NOT married to the syllabus um, I tend to marry human beings and not a piece of paper I will make adjustments but I'm not gonna make many adjustments because I don't want to confuse everybody however I do want you to know that if there are adjustments that will be announced and I'm not afraid to do that kind of thing um, I'm not afraid to be creative so if you all come up with some kind of idea that I can use to make the class better you know certainly feel free to do that and the other thing is I don't expect you to have this stuff perfect right now you know I received <laughs> hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of text messages and emails everything from what format do you want which I do understand right APA format but I'm not big on that I'm big on you developing your ideas um, if you decide that you want to publish something in the future then yeah APA makes sense but right now get your ideas together citations that's fine I don't care uh, make make your citations make them make them good ones if you have them okay um, for next week oh hello Richie next week the um, assignment is really very simple Hold on, let me put that down who's mine you know I had a, a professor when I took Spanish back in college see I took uh, five years hey Paul I took five years of four let's see four years of French in high school and when I went to Denison I passed out of a couple years of French I said oh, let me take Spanish I took Spanish and I was doing great the problem was is I conjugated everything in French and you know I got a C plus and I wasn't about to get C pluses so I went back to French and got B pluses which I'll take over C plus but probably should if I knew I was going to Miami I would have gone ahead and stayed in the uh, Spanish class because El Gringo here cannot speak much Spanish um, which yeah, it's okay um, they call me at Primerica where I work part-time they call me El Gringo Hispanico because I'm the only English person English speaking person in the whole office which I kinda like it that way um, I learned a whole lot by doing it this way so in any case that's pretty much it the assignment for next week is really simple and all I'm having you do is pick a drug issue that is relevant to the United States I don't care what you pick all right and you're gonna do a one to two page assignment assessment of that uh, particular um, topic it is um, called a mini paper one and it's all described in the syllabus you know you can pick whatever you can pick um, bijou you can pick um, you can pick something that has to do for example with steroids and sports you can do something on opioid addiction you can do uh, college students who do this you can turn it in early uh, yes I'm absolutely okay with that oh that reminds me um, I, I definitely prepare uh, prefer sorry hello Carolina I definitely prefer for you to try to figure out how to do it within blackboard all right um, if you can do it in blackboard it's so much easier for me to grade it keeps me a lot more organized because a lot of people send in their um, assignments through uh, my gmail account which is sean.hopeworks at gmail.com the problem is is that if they didn't have a title on it it made it into a nightmare and because I have eight classes running through that one email uh, address it made it really hard to stay organized so what I had to do is I had to go back in and just do the ones that were uh, in Blackboard so if you can figure it out spend a couple extra minutes doing that I sure appreciate it Mr. the human behavior class I thought it was in Blackboard oh okay Richie you, you know this is what I'm talking about it's all understandable right I, um, I have announced a few times that uh, my live streams are on YouTube and I posted the web website and I, I've given links and all that kind of stuff is written in the syllabus however what I understand is is that you know all your professors use different platforms some use zoom uh, some use blackboard uh, some use uh, collaborate I like uh, YouTube myself because I know that everyone understands YouTube your, your YouTube generation and actually I like doing live streams I post it on my little page and and by the way feel free to subscribe to that page and I'm really interested if you have friends who like the topics that we discuss 
they're more than welcome to subscribe because I'm going to be doing a lot more with the page coming up. By the way, uh, one of the things I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be doing like a podcast through live uh, through YouTube. And I just finished last night writing my sixth book in the last three years. Uh, I finished writing the book Hope Works. Um, what is it called? Moving from darkness into into your dream. That's what it's called. So I finished writing that book last night. I'm editing it. It's going to be released. And I'm kind of moving in that kind of direction. The last five books were all on lethal violence. And I got, you know, I got so tired of living in a dark world that I just made the decision it's time to write something positive. So I take you know, some autobiographical stuff and then I move it into how do we build hope and then how can we take hope to build our lives as, as we see it. Are there any questions with anything at this point in time before I move into the actual live stream lecture part of the class? Lecture. Hmm. Ask La Ashley. If you ask her, if we're in a live class, in a live classroom setting, brother, I don't, I don't lecture at all. I, I mean, we just flow. Wherever we are is where we go. Now I have to be a little bit more structured which is fine. But does, do any of you have a question? And don't ask me about WhatsApp and all that kind of stuff. I mean stuff pertaining to uh, the course at this point in time. Otherwise, if you don't, I'll start moving into it. It's weird. We're, we're 11 and a half minutes into it and I haven't said anything yet. Isn't that, that's crazy. That's crazy. Melanie, I know you're in another class too. Um, it's, it's interesting that half of you in here uh, aren't even on my list. So, yeah, well, what you trying to say Ashley what you trying to say you know um, but you know I'm doing the best I can do uh, maybe next semester in the January term uh, some of you will take me live which is a whole different experience than uh, than this you know I'm sitting here looking at a computer screen imagining what you're hearing and you know it's not so funny that way it's kind of you know it is what it is and I know you can't sit here forever um, and that's fine you know? all right so are there any other questions Ashley thanks for blowing me up like that uh, letting everybody know that you know I've let you down and stuff. I know how you are. I know exactly how you are, girl. Don't even start with me. So let's go ahead. I just mess with you. You know that. Um, you know what's so funny about Ashley? Can, uh, I don't even know if I can say this. It don't matter. Ashley has worked perennially as a um, work study student in the in the social sciences department. And there's something about my voice. I don't know what it is. Every time I walk in and say, Yo, what's up, Ashley? Her phone starts talking to me. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what it is. It, it's the weirdest thing. What is it? Siri or Alexa or whoever it is? Um, <laughs> I don't know. It's crazy. So anyhow, all right. Let's do this. Boom. Narcotics. I have long uh, wondered. You know, I grew up in a household where uh, I was absolutely forbidden to use drugs. Right. I, I, I grew up in a very, very violent home. And I was always told that if I ever came home under the influence of drugs, that I would, in fact, be murdered. And so I, I took that seriously. Okay. Um, but the root of it is what's probably more fascinating. You know, here's the thing. Most of you don't know me. Ashley, just sit back and chill on this one for a minute. You know, go get something to drink or eat or whatever it is you're going to do and just let me walk through this. Right. One of the things I'm most interested in, and if we were in a live class, you'd really see this to be true, and that is, I don't believe that anything that's in front of us is truth. Right? I don't believe that there is a fact that exists in and of itself, and I don't believe that there's a truth that exists in and of itself. Me, personally, I think everything is socially constructed, which means, uh, essentially, you and I come to an agreement that some piece of human nature, some piece of behavior, some piece of truth, is something that we negotiate. It doesn't exist in and of itself, we create it. Right? So, one of the things that most people don't know about, and we're using a uh, traditional textbook here, is that when I walk into a class, no, when I walk into a classroom, I'm not wearing a bandana, okay, and I'm definitely not wearing this dirty ass hat. I come into the room, I usually have a button down shirt, I don't have a polo saying Ohio State on it, wherever it is. I don't um, come in wearing a bandana and a hat. Typically, I come in, you know, I got my, my, my shoes on, you know, my black shoes. I got some black slacks on and, you know, usually a purple shirt because uh, I'll teach. Purple's my color, you know, I'm a Prince fan and, you know, purple's always been. Um, uh, Chris, but did, what's your question? Is the topic of this class uh, drugs in America? It's narcotics in America, but I teach it as a drug and society class, yes. 
Um, so that I, I hope that answers that question. But one of the things I've learned along the way is that what you see is not what you get. Okay? Yeah, it's 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 narcotics in society. All right. So when I walk into a room, and Ashley can vouch for this, is that most people don't know who I am as a person. They may have looked at rate my professor and they say, oh, he's easy. He's an easy grade, which, you know, in some ways I am. But the reason I'm an easy grade is not because I'm easy. The reason I'm easy is because I tell you exactly what I want. And if you do what I want, then you're going to get a good grade. That's why I want you to watch that video, How to Write a Great Paper, because once you learn how to structure your paper that way, the paper is going to write itself. And, you know, I've always told students in the past that if you write a paper, I should be able to pull your paper out of the pile and give it to my chair or the dean, and it should be an A paper. So if they would give you an A, I'll give you an A. That's basically how I look at it. So I walk into a room, and most of you will see that, you know, I'm a European American male. I'm white. I'm a male. I dress a certain way. And if you looked and did any kind of research whatsoever, you would see, in fact, that I have a PhD. I have a PhD from Ohio State. I have four master's degrees, uh, MBA, I don't know, sociology, conflict management, and, I don't know, public administration or something like that. Um, so I have, you know, four or five master's degrees, PhD. And you look at that on, my, on a piece of paper, you say, oh, man, that guy must be kind of smart. Uh, I'm really not. All it means is I showed up to class and I did the work and submitted it. Um, and you'd probably assume that I have money because I have a good income. And I do have some money, but it's not as much as it should be. It's not as much a, uh, as I was trending towards because before certain types of things happened in my life. But if you just look at me on the surface, right, you're going to be grossly misdirected in who I am because who I am is vastly different than what you see, right? Who I am is a kid who was raised in the inner city. I was raised in the inner city of Toledo, Ohio, the east side, and I was, which was just 50 miles south of Detroit. And if you ever look at crime statistics, you would find immediately that Toledo is far more violent in terms of crime rate than Miami and a lot of other cities in the nation. And so if you take a look at where I came from, the first thing you wouldn't know is that I was raised in an African-American family. There's no way for you to know that. If you look at my skin, then you assume that I was raised in a white family most likely, but you certainly didn't assume that I was raised in an African-American family. The other thing you probably didn't assume, because I'm not using uh, I'm not using slang or anything like that at this particular moment, you'd also assume that I probably came from the middle class, which I did not. I was raised poor. And because I tend to be very even keeled and very patient with people, you probably would not ever be able to guess that I came from one of the most violent one of the most violent neighborhoods and homes that you can imagine. As a matter of fact, every day of my young life was spent in massive terror. I always feared I didn't know who was going to get killed in my lifetime. Uh, I was raised by an African American woman named Mama Green. She was she was brutal and she was loving all at the same time. She's the type of person if she was on your side, you loved having her there, but you didn't want to cross her because she would take you out. And so everyone respected her right from the jump and didn't give her much grief. But if they did, they paid for it, right? Well, she was she was the person that raised me, and so a lot of my ethics come from uh, that particular household. But you couldn't see it by looking at me. You understand? So. We make these assumptions based upon what we see when the fact is we really don't know those people. The other thing you don't know is that, unless I tell you, is that while I grew up in the inner city, while I grew up in this violent home, this violent neighborhood, while I was poor, you can't tell by looking at me either, necessarily, that I went to the best private school in the state of Ohio. Right? I went to a place that you know, is like similar to Gulliver or Riviera or something like that, Everglades, uh, Ransom, whatever. I went to a fantastic school. It's one of the top in the country. So on the one hand, I went to this great school every day. But on the other hand, I grew up in mortal terror, right? And so when you see me walk into a classroom or you see me on these videos, right, you have no idea the baggage that I'm bringing with me, right? Now, here's the reason why I bring this up is because if we were actually in a physical classroom, what I know is, is that I can't see you either. Just because you're sitting in that chair, right? Just because you might be Hispanic or Latino or Latina or what have you, just because you may be a certain height, just because you may be quiet or you may be loud, doesn't mean I know anything about you. I don't look at you based upon your cover. And what, I, what I've learned over time is that just like I wear a mask, I have a very distinct mask. I don't let anybody in here. I fake you out. 
I'll tell you certain types of things so you think you know me, but I'm protecting what is called my authentic self. We have a virtual self that we put out to the world and then an authentic self that we protect with everything we have. And what I notice when I'm in a classroom is that when I look out into that classroom, I can see that a lot of you are hiding behind a mask. A lot of you are hiding behind a mask and we don't know where it comes from, right? So when I teach a class, and Ashley can vouch for this, I'm sure, is that I try to meet you where you are. And here's what I know. Some of you, as of right this moment, are in a violent dating relationship. I don't know who you are. I obviously only see some dots on a screen. But even in a real life situation, I know that some of you would be. I know some of you have uh, suffered through sexual assault. I know some of you have come who ha have been addicted to drugs. And some of you are fighting addiction now. And some of you are addicted to other things. I know that. So when you come into the classroom, guess what? Hold up. Hold up. Kevin Trampos. Hold on a second. All right. There we go. Welcome, Kevin. So what I know is, is that you're carrying something. Oh, nice. I knocked my glasses off my face. You have a uh, virtual self and an authentic self, too. So when I come in to teach class, here's what I know. If you're in a violent relationship, if you're addicted to drugs or whatever the addiction is, gambling perhaps, um, you can't give me your best. How can you? Right? If you have to make the decision between uh, getting gas for your car or getting food or paying your tuition, and I think you can be your absolute best in the classroom, I'd be absolutely wrong. Some of you, and I don't know who you are, um, but some of you probably struggle with suicidal ideation. How do I know it? Because every semester I get two, three, four people who confide in me that they're going through these particular struggles. Now, I don't share who they are, but they come to me and we talk it through and we work it out. And I get, you know, some of you are homeless, so you're trying to figure out where you're going to stay tonight. Who are you going to stay with? What couch are you going to lay on? Do I have to stay in my car? Do I feed my kids? Well, most of you probably don't have kids yet, but if you're a, a, a typical a night class, you probably would. So what I look at is I don't know you. So how can I judge you? My job is to try to find a way for you to maximize your strength, utilize your courage, so that you can give me the best work that you can do. And you will see and rate my professor, oh, he cares. I do care. And the reason I care is because if it wasn't for teachers along the way, I wouldn't be here now. It was teachers, it was Mama Green, it was all these people, the gang members. Look, I was protected by gang members all the time from our rival gang, which was the Weiler, Weiler Street Homeboys. And the, the Wilder Street gang, they were all people who had come from, come down from Detroit, from the Detroit boys that settled a few blocks away from where I lived, a couple blocks away. So there's a Hathaway Street, later Facet Street, that was going up against Wilder, Wilder Homes boys. And then later, our neighborhood became Crips, and their neighborhood became Bloods, right? So where I grew up, where I was in a situation where I was protected um, by the, well, later the Crips, and earlier the Facet Street. So... You know, when I take a look at that, it was really hard for me to concentrate in school. You know that? Because I used to get beat up. I had a violin that I played, and I'd walk, I'd get off the yellow school bus, and when I got off the yellow school bus, oftentimes I got beat up. Who did I get beat up by? Oftentimes by people who were high on drugs, because my neighborhood was a drug center within the city of Toledo. Everything you can imagine was in my neighborhood. It wasn't a lot of cocaine, but there's a lot of speed. There's a whole lot of prescription drugs. There's marijuana everywhere. And there was heroin. Oh God, we had we had it all. So every time I got off the bus, people would judge me. They called it. I went to a place called Mommy Valley Country Day School, and what they would say is, "Oh, here comes that uh, that stuck up snob, the kid from Monkey Vomit Country Day School." I was like, "What Monkey Vomit? What what, what, what kind of name is that?" And then they would chase me down the street. They'd beat me up, and when I was playing a violin, they beat me to a pulp. Sometimes they'd line me and my my best friend up against a um, wall and they would hit us in the face with ice balls that were filled with rocks. And I don't know if you've ever been hit in the face with an ice ball. That hurts by itself. But if you get hit in the face with an ice ball with a big rock in it, then you're, man, you're, you're just like, you're, you're knocked out like this. You're like, oh. And then we were just eight, nine years old and we had 18, 19, 20 year olds hitting us with that. So, you know, I take a look at it and I'm just happy to be here. But the beauty of it is, and there's a lot of beauty in it, the beauty of my particular background is, is that I am here to stand for you. Because some of you are going through things I'll never understand. So it may have to be that I have to go ahead and be your, be your guide, to be your shoulder or what have you. And I also know, here's what I know for a stone cold fact, if you're going through one of these situations, all right, I know a lot of you will turn to drugs, whether it's prescription drugs, 
whether it's ecstasy or Xanax bars or whatever the hell you're taking, um, shrooms and all these kind of things, I know that a lot of that is to deal with the emotion of the things that are happening in the background. Because, you know, if we take a look at human nature, speaking of human nature, right, and I wish this was a live class, I'd just say, what is it? What is human nature? Now say, if we were looking at it from a psychological perspective, what is it? What about a biological perspective? What about a sociological? What about a physics? Can't really do that here. But I'll break down human nature into two camps. All right? There's two camps. There's one camp, and I'm going to type this out, it is the Thomas Hobbes camp. And the other one is the Jean-Jacques Rousseau camp. Okay? These are the two camps. The Thomas Hobbes camp just makes the fundamental assumption that human beings by nature are evil. Right? They're greedy, they're selfish, they're self-centered, they're mean, they're derelict, and they are born evil. Right? So Thomas Hobbes definitely has his negativistic view. And he said that they're negativistic, they're utilitarian, and they are menacing. So what does that mean? What that means is, is that the reason why people are, if someone commits a crime, if you believe that they're inherently evil, then that ideology says that you should punish that person, right? Because they're inherently bad. So if they transgress, you take them and you put them to prison. Now, what's interesting about that, if you go back to the 1980s, which none of you were alive at that point, which really makes me feel old because, man, bro, I was kicking it in the 80s. You know, I started going to the clubs when I was, what, 12 years old, 1978, disco kid. It's a little embarrassing to admit now, but yeah, we went to disco kid, and then by the time I'm 12, 14, I was 14, they had teen night at Buttons, and I went to Buttons all the way for the next six years. Then we had Renee's Fun Drinkery at 16, then Glass City Boardwalk by the time I was 18. And that's all we did was go to clubs from 12 on, right? And I mean, it was... It was fun. It's a whole different generation. But back then, we were going through a transformation in our society where coming out of the Civil Rights era, coming out of the 1970s, we started to find people as inherently evil. We went through what is called the Law and Order Campaign, and if you were transgressing against the uh, normative expectations of society, if you were engaging in crime, we punished you, right? If you were a heroin addict in the 1970s, baby, we weren't trying to rehabilitate you. We weren't looking at this as an opioid crisis. We were sending you to prison. Goodbye, good night. It's over. That's all it was. There is an incarceration of disproportionately young African American men who were displaced or alienated in urban areas. And why was that? Because we were Hobbesian. Now, a lot of people uh, like Trump right now because you see the signs. A lot of people don't like Trump. But the one thing that's obvious about Trump, Trump believes in Thomas Hobbes. He clearly says, you know, these people who are engaging in this behavior right now in our society, you know, they're, they're undermining the fabric. They're undermining our social contract, and they are inherently evil criminals, and we should punish them, right? That's not something that he made up. That's something that comes out of the 60s and the 70s under the Law and Order campaign. It's a Hobbesian approach. Trump has a Hobbesian approach when it comes to crime control. Now, the flip side is, on human nature, is some people say, oh, yeah, people, yeah, they're not just mean. People are also very nice. They're cooperative. They try, to, they try to uphold others. They try to be decent people, right? In other words, according to Rousseau, we are what you call tabula rosa, which means we are born a blank slate. We are, by our virtue, by our nature, we are good human beings, right? However, we get misled. And we get misled because there are people and influences in our life that take us off our path. Okay, So when they take us off our path, then what we do, instead of like punishing them just to punish them, we try to get them back on their path. Right? In other words, if, if we know that, if we assume that engaging in crime or, you know, these 12-step programs with AA and NA and SA and all these different A's, if you take a look at all those different A's, the 12-step program essentially means that you have a sickness, right? NA being Narcotics Anonymous, you have a sickness. And because of that sickness, we can help you either through prayer or we can help you through therapy or modification, you know, be behavior modification therapies. In other words, what we can do is rehabilitate you. So if you are of the Rousseau, Jean-Jacques Rousseau position, where people are inherently good but they get misled, 
then when you look at crime control, you're going to say, hey, look, these are still people. They're good people. They just went in the wrong direction. Let's get them back on track. In other words, the rehabilitation model is designed according to a perspective of human nature. The lock them up and throw away the key is the same thing. It's nothing but an ideology that we use to support what we believe. And by the way, I don't believe any, either of them are right. I don't believe either of them are wrong. I think the problem is, is that I, I'm much more of, I don't even know what it's called. I, I see good and bad in both of the positions. And here's what happens. You know, me personally, I'm, I'm not going to prison. That's not me. You don't have to make a new law for me to behave differently. All you got to do is nothing because I know I'm not going to prison. I'm not pretty like I used to be. I'm not trying to be sold for a couple cigarettes either. You know what I'm saying? So here's the thing. People like me, deterrence doesn't work because we're already deterred. Here's what they find with deterrence. You can make the laws real strong or you can make them real soft. It's irrelevant because people who would be deterred already are already deterred. Does that make sense? So crime control may or may not make any sense for a person like me because I'm not going. Not me. I'm not going for something stupid like stealing gasoline from, from the gas station not paying up, oh, brother. If I'm doing something, I'm going all the way. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to do something that, you know, it's going to be it's going to be some kind of, well, I'm not going to tell you what I would do because if it happens, then you're going to say, hey, Shwanisi said that. I do something stupid like, you know, something like some kind of fraud, you know, some kind of cybersecurity fraud where I get a half a penny from every American and end up making, you know, $30 million a year because I'm siphoning a penny off of you. Uh, I wouldn't feel too bad off of one penny. But anyhow, forget all that. Do you understand the relationship between a philosophy on human nature and how it's tied to punishment? And how, it's not just tied to punishment, it's also tied to how we interpret what people are like. Right? So, in my neighborhood, where I grew up, I went back there in 2017, in December of 2017. And when I went back, I went to my own there. I, I did a keynote speech for my high school, and <clears throat> I stayed with my best friend. His name is his, his sister. My best friend is Booney, and his sister is Debbie. And I stayed with him. And oh, it's okay, Jonathan. Don't even worry about it, baby. You're here. That's all I care about. That you are here. Let me just write you down, John. Okay. Boom. Boom. Oh, there you go. Okay. And I stayed with her. And at the time, you know, I like to celebrate with a you know, little little fruit juice, if you know what I'm saying. So I went and got a 12 pack of fruit juice over at the corner, at the corner uh, Walgreens or whatever it was. No, a convenience store. They had gas there. I go in and I'm in a suit. And everyone's staring at me. I'm like, what are they all looking at? And I go in, I get my little 12 pack of fruit juice and I put it up on the counter. And they had this little news magazine. Uh, and I looked at, I'm looking at the news magazine, and the news magazine essentially was saying, uh, East Siders coming, East Side Kid. East Siders who are in prison. I said, Oh, this looks interesting. So I'm thumbing through it. I said, Dang, look at all these people. And they have a magazine for it. And I'm like, Holy crap. Okay, let me go ahead and grab this. So I, I'm walking out with my brew, and this guy comes running up, taps me on the shoulder real hard. And I'm like, What's up, man? He said, You got to pay for that. I said, I did pay for this. I said, It was like, you know, $12. He said, no, man, not the fruit juice. You got to pay for that magazine. I said, this piece of, because all it was was like a printer, uh, it was a Xerox printout that they stapled in. I said, I got to pay for this? So this is just a printout. <laughs> I said, you just did a Xerox and put some staples in the middle. How much is it? They said, $6. I said, six? Shit, you must be crazy. I'm not doing six. So I gave it back. By the time I had walked out, right, to get back in the car, the police had come and arrested three people. They're frisking them. I'm like, when did this happen? As it turns out, it was all drug addiction. My whole entire neighborhood now is under the scourge of heroin and under opioids. It's being literally destroyed by these drugs. So we could take a look at it, and if we were Hobbesian, we would say, look, are you serious? Put those addicts in prison because they are inherently unable to control their impulses and they are engaging in behavior that undermines our society and is a danger to everybody. Put them in prison. Then there's others who say, well, wait a minute, they're good people. What are they hiding from? What are they fighting from? And we go ahead and move them into rehabilitation, right? So when we start to take a look at it, we can see 
directly that our perception on human nature has a direct effect on the way in which we engage in crime control policies, whether it's drugs, and it's not just how we engage in the policies, it also shapes our interpretation of what people do when they are uh, associated with drugs and narcotics. For an example, back in the 1980s, during the crack epidemic, you know, we got so tough on drugs in 86. We wrote, we wrote the most draconian drug laws in American history, right, where we, we treated you differently if you distributed cocaine versus crack cocaine. And essentially, we made it so strong that if, if you were 18 or over and you dealt within a, what is it, 100, 100 feet of a school, it doubled your prison term, right? If you're over 18, you got double the prison term for selling crack cocaine than you did for selling uh, powder cocaine. Well, here's why that's interesting. We always assume somehow that criminal offenders are not smart, that they're stupid. They're stupid. They're dealing drugs. Are you serious? You can get another job. And I understand the economics part of it, and that's where you're all coming in, but I'm just talking about in general. We gave those persons who are 18 and over such stiff penalties, they were getting longer sentences than if you murdered somebody, right? They were getting 12, 13, 14 years, and during the Reagan administration, um, they definitely tried to pass capital punishment for drug trafficking, right, for uh, dealing crack cocaine. It never passed, but they were trying to. But here's what happened. When they made these laws so restrictive that those persons 18 and over were going to get double and triple the life se or the, the sentence that they would if they did powder cocaine, here's what they did. They started hiring the teenagers, right? Because the teenagers were only going to get a couple years. So they started hiring those kids between the ages of 14 and 17 because if they get caught, they're not going to get the uh, what, what they call the George Jetson where their um, sentence went way out into the future. They were going to get something moderate. So what happened was, is that in the 80s, the drug traffickers, the big ones, right, they started hiring the little kids because they knew that the little kids were not going to go to prison for the same amount of time. Well, here's the issue. That's pretty evil when you hire a little kid who now, because the rate of homicide for little kids between 13 and 17 skyrocketed, it was about 100 per 100,000. Our homicide rate now is 6 per 100,000. And can you imagine, that means it was, you are 16 times more likely to get murdered as a teenager in the 1980s between uh, the ages of 13 and 17 than the national rate is now. And we said, well, these people who are engaging in this drug war are mean, malicious, et cetera, et cetera. It's not what they were. They were adaptive, right? They were strictly adaptive. Uh-oh. No, 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 Alonzo. Sorry, man, Radel. This is, this is, this is our nar narcotics class. Um, Thursday is Narcotics and Corrections. The uh, 1191 class, I believe, is on Monday night or Tuesday night. You have to check your syllabus. You have to check your syllabus, okay? So if we take a look at, and that's for a lot of you, because a lot of you may be in the wrong class tonight. Follow that syllabus. That syllabus that um, is associated with the class you took at the beginning is the one that, no, no, man, don't be sorry. Stay in here, man. You're, you're, you're welcome to be in here. Um, I want everybody in here, bring your friends, bring your family, you know, um, have them subscribe to the channel, whatever you want to do. It, it's, it's open game. I don't mind sharing knowledge. I'm too old. Like, like Mama Green used to say, I'm too old a cat to get scratched in the ass by a kitten. At this point in my life, man, listen, if you want to learn something, just come on in. Let's learn it. If you want to pass it on to other people, let's pass it on. If you want to share my channel, you share my channel because great things are coming uh, down the way. Thanks, Radell. I appreciate that. Man, you're, you're the GOAT, baby. That's all I got to say about it. So, as a matter of fact, just a side note, in my book that I wrote, Hope Works, I do settle the debate as to whether or not Michael Jordan or LeBron James or Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is the greatest of all time. There's a specific chapter on that specifically, and I came, I came away with saying Dr. J was the greatest of all time. But you have to read the reasoning why, because most of you are going to say, if you follow basketball, well, Doc wasn't the greatest of all time. Doc, read the book. So anyhow. What we're really getting into is human nature, ideology, and the basis of common sense. Right? Common sense is most of you have it, but none of you have it. Right? Because when you see me as a white male walking in the class and you make assumptions as to what I am, you are using your common sense to assess Sean Schwatter, right? And so often those assessments are incorrect. I can't assess who you are based upon this surface thing. My common sense says 
that there's a lot of variety and variation, right? But we're not taught that. We're taught to look at groups of people as if they are a category. And that's where things get really dangerous. So common sense, right? Common sense really is a shared system of meaning designed to understand the world in which we live. Common sense, right? Okay, and I know that when you're in high school, you used to go to the cafeteria and you'd point across the room and say, and they don't have any common sense. And now you talk about them now. They don't have any common sense. And then you take a look and you go sit in their conversation. They're looking at you saying, man, they don't have any common sense. So you're saying they don't. They're saying you don't. And look what happens. When they say you don't have common sense and you say they don't, you created a barrier. You created a wall that now can't be penetrated. Let's expand that out. Now the argument is if you are protesting the police with Black Lives Matter, right, you don't have common sense. But if you're Black Lives Matter and you flip it back over to looking at the police, you say they don't have common sense, right? And then what we start to see is, well, punish the looters, punish the protesters, rather than saying what are the conditions look like, punish them. Why? Because that's common sense. But you see the common sense is different. Why do we have such a big debate about whether or not athletes take a knee or they don't? Right? That's a common sense debate. Because we believe that if you take a knee, you don't represent American standards. Therefore, you can't take a knee. And there's all kinds of arguments with that. Colin Kaepernick can't even play football anymore because he's been labeled due to common sense. Right? It created a boundary. And then when the guys do take a knee, there are people like Mike Dick and all these other people who say, man, that's unpatriotic. You don't represent the United States. You don't represent what it is to be American if you're taking a knee in protest. What are you talking? But the fact of the matter is, is that taking a knee is a form of civil disobedience, correct? It is a way of voicing your opinion under the First Amendment where you're allowed to, uh, free, ex free expression. So what we're really seeing is not patriotic in either direction. What we're seeing is, is that our common sense is clashing with their common sense. In other words, see, common sense, where does it come from? If we take a look at common sense and its ideology, its roots, right? Where does it come from? Okay, here's where it comes from. Let me go through here what's on my screen. And if I look down this screen, I see Paul is here, unless he left. Richie is here, unless he left. Bijou is here, unless he left. Tatiana's here, unless she left. Carolina, Tatiana, Ashley, Chris, Kevin, Jonathan, Raydell. Those are all your names. My question is simple. How in the hell do you know that's your name? How do you know, Paul, that you're Paul? How do you know, Richie, that you're Richie? Bijou, how do you know this? It's because somebody told you, right? When you popped out and you were born that one magical day, about 18 to 21 years ago, there was a man and a woman, perhaps, that said, there goes Tatiana right there. There goes Carolina, look. And then someone picked you up and they're holding you and they're rocking by baby and coochie, coochie, coo. Oh, hey, Carolina, coochie, coochie, coo. Hey, what's going on, Chris? There's Chris. Here come the neighbors to celebrate your birth. Look, there's Chris. There's Chris. There's Chris. Oh, let me hold Chris. Oh, Chris, coochie, coochie, coo, Chris. Then one day, someone says, Chris, and you look up and you know that's who you are. You weren't born, Chris. You became Chris. And when you became Chris, there are all these ideas associated with who you are, right? And you learn to define yourself as Chris or Carolina or Schwaneezy, right? Which is my nickname. So what does all that mean? That means that nothing exists except what we create, including who you are, who you think you are, and what you are. Right? Who you are and what you are was socially constructed at that point by your primary socialization agents, those first people that brought you in the world. And what did they teach you? Okay, let's say for example that I think people are inherently good. All right? If that's my perspective, our perspective as a family, do you think I'm going to turn around and spank you every time you slobber on yourself because we think you're evil? What's most likely to happen is our philosophy is going to be passed on to you. And then you go through life, right? And you keep learning all these things. You learn from your parents first. Then you start to learn from the kids at school. 
and the teachers at school. Then you start to learn from your peer groups later. And usually what happens is, and tell me if I'm wrong, I might be wrong, but as we're going through school, we seek out people who we're comfortable with, don't we? Or am I too old to understand this? So we seek out people that we're comfortable with, and where do we, why are we comfortable? Because they share the same common perspective that we do. Because it's very rare, it happens, I'm sure. It's very rare, uh-oh. Charlie, what is your real name, right? Charlie, Charlie. Charlie, what's your, what's your real last name? So we associate with people who oftentimes we get along with, right? They often share the same values. So what happens is this. Oh my God, I would have never guessed that. Are you in the right class tonight? You're welcome to be here. Let's see here. Alejandro. Why can't I have a cool name like that? Sean Schwanner. Who in the hell names their kid the same name twice? Sean Schwanner. Even my stepfather couldn't say my name right. He kept calling me Sean Schwanner. I'm not Sean Schwanner. Schwanner. Schwan. You married a Schwanner. Then I had my first wife. She didn't know what my name was. I came home one day. I knew we should, when, when, once you start seeing your first wife, she's practicing writing my last name. She wrote it 16 different ways. I said, um, let me ask you a question. Do you know who you married? She said, I married you. I said, well, it doesn't seem like it. Um, <laughs> it seems like uh, you married somebody else um, because you haven't spelled my name correctly one time. That's right, you're in corrections next week, man. But yes, yeah, stick around, it's all good, because you had an abbreviated class, stuff that we're covering now, you're gonna cover next week anyhow. So stick around, Charlie, it's fine. All right, so here's what happens. Your first component of common sense is derived from word of mouth. Word of mouth. I'll write it down in case you can't hear me. Word of mouth. That is the people around you share with you stories. They share with you their perspective. They share with you their um, understanding of the world. Okay, And with that, the complete repetition over and over and over and over again, you start to believe based upon word of mouth. Right? Most people don't wake up and say, mm, I can't wait not to fit in today. I can't wait to be poor. I can't wait to get beat up. I can't wait to be hated. I'm going to join a group today that hates me by the virtue of what I look like, what I act like, and what I think like. That's what I want to do. No. People typically try to associate with people who are much like themselves. Why? Because it helps us fit in. It helps us get along. And that promotes stability in our everyday life. So word of mouth is really important in developing common sense. Right? We think we have common sense, but we have it simply because we've associated with people throughout our whole lives who share the same common understanding. Then here's what's next. Right? From when you're about this big, there's a TV on in your home, or there's social media on in your home, and what happens is, is that your whole entire life outside the family and friends and stuff like that is constructed based upon media portrayals of crime. The media. The media constructs for you um, the definition of what is criminal, right? So for example, it depends on how you look at all these things, right? Um, the media, what they do, is you watch the media in accordance to what you believe. And typically, if I ask you to list for me the first three crimes that come to your mind, I know that you're using common sense because 90%, 92% of everyone who I've ever asked that question, going back to 1992, will put down murder, right? 92% of the time. About 70% of the time, they'll put down robbery. About 52% of the time, it'll be rape. And then it'll be those three about 30% of the time. But and people will put in human trafficking or whatever, domestic violence, but usually murder is placed in there. And the reason is real simple. It's because if we start to think about what's the first crime that comes to our mind, it should be the crime that happens most frequently. It shouldn't be the one that's rare. It should be the one that happens most frequently because the law of numbers says that our thoughts should revolve around that which is numerically most widespread. Larceny theft. That's the crime you should be thinking about. That's the one you're going to be victimized with most likely is larceny theft. Or the number one crime overall, that's index offense, index one. But if you take a look at all crime, it is drug abuse violations. That's the number one crime. So the question comes down to, why do we think in terms of homicide? If you were born and you didn't know your freaking name and you learned it over time, the reason why you think about homicide first is strictly because external forces continue to define for you what our crime control problem is. And we continue to portray violent crime. 
And it's not just violent crime, it's crimes against strangers, right? So our focus is on strangers, when the fact of the matter is if you're going to get killed, you're going to get killed by someone who knows you. Typically a friend, right, that's the number one category if you take out unknowns, right? If you take out unknowns, the number one group of people that's going to kill you are your friends and your, uh, your family. If you are a female, once you take friends out, the number one category is you're going to get killed by your husband, right? Husbands getting killed by their wives is ranked like number eight. Girlfriends getting killed by boyfriends, number three. Right? So we see some gendered expectations here. We see friends battling friends. But when you flip on the news, here's what they show you. And they do it every freaking time. What they show you is, is a violent crime in which is so heinous that it's unimaginable. Or they take a, uh, 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 an attack against an innocent civilian, a stranger. Particularly if it's a kid. If it's a young person who is really doing well in school or a female, uh, that, a white female who randomly gets killed, in a drive-by or what have you, or a kid gets killed in a drive-by, that becomes newsworthy. But it's such a rare event, right? It detracts away attention from what is most likely to happen is friends killing friends. And why do friends kill friends? If you want to get down, if we talk about gun control and all this kind of stuff, well, let's get down to what really happens when people get killed. What really happens is, yeah, they use a firearm 70% of the time, but over 50% of the times in which someone gets killed, both parties were under the influence of alcohol. So if we're going to do something about violent crime, why are we not addressing the issue of, uh, of alcohol consumption? And not just alcohol consumption, the other part is how do we construct that this context is the one in which it's appropriate to pull a trigger, right? In other words, conflict management skills. Why do we not develop conflict management skills from kindergarten all the way through the current period when that's where the conflict comes from? It comes from people who know each other who don't have the, uh, the, the internal methodologies, the communication skills, to communicate across boundaries. So what happens is, is we find that those persons will kill each other. And what's that? It's media-driven, baby. You don't think for yourself. Are you serious? Everything for you is medium-constructed. It's either constructed through the news, and either you watch Fox because you believe that people are inherently evil and we need to control them, or you watch CNN where we believe that people are inherently misled and that we can rehabilitate, but the fact of the matter is they're reporting the same exact thing, right? They're reporting the coronavirus, they're reporting the protests, and they're reporting um, the arguments that are going both ways, rather than saying, you know, these are newsworthy, but so is this, right? So what happens is our perspective gets shaped by word of mouth and media, and the third category is, is by politics. Politics is the third category that shapes our common sense, and here's what you do. Look, in a given moment, in a given day, so much information is thrown at you, right? I have a ceiling fan uh, up here that's you know, keeping me cool, right? Well, am I sitting here thinking about the physics of the ceiling fan? I could, but that'd be a lot more information that I can handle. The fact that this light works, or the internet, or Wi-Fi, or this camera, right? Or the fact that some of you may be bored, some of you may not be bored. If I try to assimilate and understand all the information that passes in front of me, I'd be confused all day long, all night. I'd never be able to sleep. So instead, what we do is, is we engage in what is called selective attention. That is, we select out information that confirms and reconfirms what we already believe. Right? So if I be, believe people are inherently evil, I go try to find evidence that says people are inherently evil. And guess what? I find the evidence and I say, damn, people are inherently evil. Or I say, you know what, people aren't bad, they're just misled. So I go out and find data that says they're not bad, they're misled. Right? And here's what happens, we create these two freaking camps. Common sense is ideologically driven. And it's driven by division. Because once you have a common sense, right, then we construct these boundaries based upon difference, based upon other. And those guys over there who believe that are a threat to us. It's the root of hatred, right? It's the root of hatred. And in the 1980s, we hated anybody who sold crack cocaine. We hated anybody who was addicted to crack cocaine. We hated these people. Rather than looking at them as people, we hated them, right? So, how does the ideology work? When we build a wall, we want to build a wall to keep people out of Mexico from coming into the U.S., because they're a threat to our jobs and violence and all that kind of stuff. That's the rhetoric. It's not a fact, but it's rhetoric. 
because the illegal immigrants who come into the United States through Mexico, they're not getting your engineering jobs. They're not stealing the engineering jobs. They're not going to take my job. They, you know, because education, their education, if, if you have family from Cuba and they were lawyers or doctors, you know they lost their degree when they came to the United States, so they can't take my job. So what jobs do they take? They take the low-end menial jobs that has uh, limited competition because they are underpaid. They're not even paid minimum wage. So those persons are two things. One, they're going to take jobs that you're not going to take. And the second thing they're going to do is they're going to try to stay under the radar because they're not trying to get deported. But what we do is, is we take the one case, and it's a horrible case, and I'm not justifying it, okay? I'm not saying it's good. But we take the one case where a random white woman with blonde hair and her baby get killed by an immigrant who's been deported. That becomes the icon of all illegal immigrants who murder, right? It's one celebrated case. Because Romero Martinez, who was a professor at FIU, now he's at Northeastern University, all he does is study immigration and homicide. And what he has found is, is that illegal immigrants have a much lower rate of homicide than people who are born in the United States. And it's strictly because they come here to work and send money back home and they want to fly under the radar. Here's the other thing. People who are going to take your jobs are coming in from Canada and then there's people coming from India who migrate to Canada and they come over uh, across the boundary because they can do that. They don't have to have a green card. They can migrate up there, come work down here, and go back up as long as they establish residence up there. You don't hear anyone talking about building a wall between the United States and Canada. So where's the boundary? The boundary is xenophobia towards those who are from Mexico, right? So when we take a look at common sense and how we construct our arguments, it's media-driven, it's political-driven, it's based upon our socialization, but what we do is we create these boundaries between us and them, between men and women, between blacks and whites, between Hispanics, blacks and whites. You know, we, we keep adding these layers, you know, uh, what is it called, sexual preference, foreign-born, all these different boundaries start to define uh, us as people. When the fact of the matter is, when I take a look at the who am I exercise that people did, who am I? Most people will list, I am a sister, I am a daughter. They define themselves in relationship to family. Many people will define themselves as a student, right? <coughs> so when we take a look at them, you came up with the same kind of roles. Because a role is a position that you occupy, right? And when you occupy a role, what that essentially means is, is that you occupy a role, but it is surrounded by expectations of behavior norms for behavior. Even emotional responses are based upon the role. Like, if I hurt your feelings in class, you might say, that mother, and say some things about me, right? You might be upset, I hurt your feelings, but it's not the same as when your sister or your brother hurts your feelings. As a matter of fact, if we take a look at it, <clears throat> the people who are most likely to hurt you are the people that you lock yourself in with, right? We were so worried about these strangers attacking us that we lock the door to keep them out. But when we lock the door to keep them out, we lock the door and keep ourselves in with the person that's most likely to murder us, to rape us, to rob us, to burglarize us, and they're definitely most likely to hurt your feelings. Right? So when we take a look at the role that you occupy, the impact of the nature of the relationship has a direct effect on the way in which your emotions play themselves out. So for example, right? When I put down, you're not going to, Richie, okay, you guys are going to make my head explode. Do not start asking me about grades. It's going to be at least a two-week turnaround. you got to understand, I'm receiving six and 700 text messages and emails per week. This was just a warm-up assignment, okay? You will get the grade when I get, can get around to it. My whole entire week has been tied to answering questions all day, every day, right? I get about a two-week turnaround before you get a grade back. And the grades I'm most interested in are your mini papers, are the term papers, are the exams. This first one, Who Am I, was just a warm-up so I can talk about human nature. That's all that was. You'll get it probably within the first couple weeks. That's how I am. Um, and it was, it's an easy grade. Look, if you submitted it, look, okay, think about it this way, Richie, okay? Think about it this way. When you submitted that assignment, how hard can I grade it? You put down who am I and you list 25 things. So if you put down I am a consumer, <laughs> I mean, what am I going to do? No, man, you're not a consumer. You fail. I can't. That, that's such an easy assignment. 
So what, I, Richie, I can't, I have so many people ask me, did you get my assignment? That it would take me, it takes me to go through three different email accounts and then go through Blackboard. I, I, for me to find one assignment is going to take me 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes and I have all these requests. So I will get to it. Here, here's what I try to tell people. When you submit your assignment, when you submit your assignment, okay, you're doing it through email, whether it's through Blackboard, which is where I want it, or through um, my Gmail account, you have a timestamp that says when you sent it. If I lose it, as long as you have that timestamp, it's in. There's nothing I can do about it, all right? And then if, if I go to give grades later and you say I didn't get a grade, then what I do is say uh, forward it to me from your timestamp, and you get the you get the credit based upon the timestamp. Please, you guys, I'm walking, I'm walking on the edge of a cliff. I've been so stressed out over all these texts and stuff. I'm going to take a couple days away from all this stuff, and I'm not going to think anything about any of my classes, not for a few days. So do the work, and just know that you will be graded fairly, all right? Because I'm only one person, and uh, you all can't see it from this side, because when we're in the live class, I can answer the question for 30 or 40 people instantaneously. But this way, it takes, it takes three, four, five hours a day to do what I can do in five minutes. And frankly, it is a very, it's a very stressful, very stressful situation on this part. I teach eight classes. I've got 200 students, right? So just know this. This is what's important. You will be fair, graded fairly. And we have built-in mechanisms so that if something falls through the cracks, we can always circle back to it. I'm not the type who's going to punish you for not submitting something, especially in a timely way, because that's not what's important. Here's what's important. Right? I said earlier that, you know, when when I come in the room, I know most of you are wearing a mask. Okay? And here's what I've learned. And I'm going to come back to this human nature thing here in just a second. And this is really important, right? And Ashley can talk about this. Grades are important. They are. But grades are part of a transactional education system. And I am a real opponent of transactional education. And here's what that means. Transactional education assumes that if you pay your money to sit in that chair, okay, that you get to sit in that chair. And when you sit in that chair, we give you a syllabus, and in response, you give us an assignment, and then from that assignment, I give you a number or a letter, you accumulate enough numbers or letter, and then at the end of it, you get three credit hours, and then you accumulate enough three credit hours, and you get to 150 or whatever the number is, you get a degree. And then from the degree, you get a piece of paper that said you paid all this money, you sat in these seats, you did the assignments that were necessary. That's one transaction after another, after another, after another. And what happens is this. Within that transactional definition, you become a proponent of, you're forced to, taking multiple choice exams. In other words, you're now being forced through the transactional system to um, try to figure out what's in my head and try to figure out what's going to be from that textbook that I'm going to put down onto that exam. So your work is to guess what's in here. You know what the material is, but you're trying to guess what's in here so you can articulate and understand what's on this exam. That's what the FCAT is. FCAT is completely designed for you to memorize information so that you can take a multiple choice at the end. And here's what we learned about the FCAT in my, excuse me, in Florida, in Miami, in Miami. If you take a look at the proficiency, the percentage of people who take that exam at the end of their senior year, do you realize only 54% pass the English and only 48% pass the math. So what's happening is, is the proficiency coming out of high school, half are capable of doing the work at their grade level. Only half. And the reason is, is because we go through this constant process of transactional, transactional, transactional homework. And here's the reason why. Because the more you transact along the way in terms of your education, the more you're forced to be a follower of those who have the authority to tell you what you should know and how you should think. Right? That's what it is. So you are being prepared to be exploited for your value in the labor market. Why? Because
because you're not being taught to think for yourself. You're being taught to answer a multiple choice exam. It's not your fault. It's not my fault. It's a transactional philosophy. And that's what's predominating. Now, here, here's where I come from. This is really important. As a matter of fact, I usually talk about this, Richie, and I'm, I'm glad you brought this up. Well, you didn't bring it up. I brought it up. But in any case, I believe in transformative education. Whereas you all worry about what the page length is and the number of words, that's transactional shit, and I'm not even interested in that. Okay? Every time you write a paper, the way you frame that paper and watch that movie, watch that video, um, How to Write a Great Paper, the way you frame your paper is going to give your ideas life. My deal is, give your ideas life. Don't ask me how many words it needs to be or how many pages. Because I'll tell you, you already need a paragraph for your introduction. You need a main body that's going to be three or four paragraphs in the conclusion. That's six paragraphs. That's two pages. If you do it well and you do it the right way and you follow those rules, you can have two pages. But if you really get into it and you give it life, it might be three, it might be four. I've had people in this class write me 25-page papers on this assignment, and guess what? I read them. Right? Because at the end of the day, no, we're not. You guys. Don't make me cry tonight. Let me finish this. And then I'm going to answer your question, Roxana. The reason I'm about transformation is because most of you are in the class for the wrong reason. Most of you are in here to get a degree. You're in here trying to get uh, situated so you can get paid when you get out, get a job. Most of you are here to get a requirement taken care of. Most of you are here so that you can get some kind of you know class or whatever but that's not why you're here the reason why you are here is for one reason and that is because sitting in each chair sitting behind those cameras that you're you're watching me from is a person who has greatness inside of them all right greatness not average and the problem is for you to find your greatness you got to know who am i what am i where am i going and in doing so you're taking the information from this class and you're owning it as you understand it. You're not going to give it back to me the way I understand I'm not going to have you take a multiple choice so you can just spit at me what I already know. I want you to come out of here with the ability to think for yourself. I want you to have the ability to look at the trends, know how you fit in the trend, and then make those trends work for you so you can magnify your greatness. When you are studying for the FCAT or when you're going through school, no one was talking about you becoming great. All they were talking about is you got to graduate and take this test. I'm the complete opposite. You must work on your greatness. And in doing so, you don't ask how many pages it is. You go give it life. It's very simple. right? Now, Roxanne, here's why I feel like crying. This is why I feel like crying right here. Okay, I'm not upset. I'm very frustrated. Because I have four or five videos that specifically say we will not be going face to face. We will be remote. It is in the syllabus. It is in the announcements. It is in the videos that I have given in class, and I'll explain why. I had two strokes this year, one in January and one in February, which makes me a high risk that if I contract coronavirus, I'm going to die. I already have a 40% chance of having a massive stroke this year. If I get the coronavirus, it goes up insurmountably, and I'm not trying to die to stand in a live classroom. Okay? So I have been exempt to teach remote the entire semester. So our classes, the ones that you're with me, are going to be remote the whole entire time. That's how they're going to be. I'm not going to teach live. Not this year, probably in January, which I prefer teaching live. But, you know, it's a trade-off because I'm not trying to die over saying common sense creates social boundaries between people. That's not, I, I'm not trying to do that. I'm trying to do that in real life. So your answer, Roxana, is no. There will be no live face-to-face. -face. And by the way, you're talking about a ca catastrophic um, situation anyhow. Because you have people who can opt out of being in the live class and they have to be online. So your professor has to teach people live online at the same time as they're teaching people in the classroom. It seems it's a calamity waiting to happen. And my, my personal opinion is, and it's an opinion, I'm not you know, an administrator, they should have planned out a January return. It's as simple as that. You're sitting in an epicenter of coronavirus in Miami. You, do you realize that if Miami were a state, it'd be ranked the number 11 state in America for coronavirus. Number 11 state, right? And we're going to go back to school. Do you know how the numbers are coming in at University of Miami for testing? 
and you're going to put me in a situation where I'm going to die? I don't think so. So no, we will, we will stay remote and do not worry so much, Richie, about your grade. Really worry about putting forth the effort. All the grades will come, all right? But that's why I was explaining at the beginning of class. When they come in in various, I mean, I'm getting email, I'm getting um, submissions in four and five different email. I don't even know how you found a couple of them. I'm getting submissions from five different sources, and, and it's like it's it's almost impossible to keep it all straight, right? And so I really want you to go through Blackboard, and if not, Sean dot Hope works um, is where where we where I want you to go. But here here's what you got to do, and this is for two weeks from now. And I'm going to put announcements in all eight of my classes. I will not be answering any more questions pertaining to when papers are due. I'm not. I'm not going to say anything again about um, when our remote schedule is because it's in the syllabus and it's in the announcements. So I'm going to make an announcement and it's going to be real simple. Just like I did at the beginning of this class period. Your papers are due on Tuesdays every other week at 11.59. Don't ask again. I can't make it any clearer than that. right? You have a paper due next week at 11.59. I'm not going to discuss the assignment. I already did. Right? Then in two weeks, you have a live stream, and it's in the syllabus, right? So I can't keep answering this question over and over again. Every other week, live stream. Every other week, a paper is due. That's clear. It's in the syllabus everywhere, right? And the way I want the papers written is in the syllabus. So I like the questions, but they're just like, it's, it's draining because I'm getting it 700 times a week, right? So I'm just trying to be clear on that. So if I can, let me go back to the common sense for a second and just let me figure out exactly where I was at that point in time. All right? No, 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 Roxanna, do not be sorry. Do not be sorry, okay? Because you're asking, you're asking a question that a lot of people are wondering themselves, and I really don't have a problem with that. So let me just clarify. All right? The live streams are every other week, and they're listed if you go to your syllabus, all right? Pull out the syllabus and on the second or third page it says course calendar. On the far, if you're looking at it, the far right hand margin, if you read downward it tells you what assignment is due, okay? And so that's why I know next week you got the mini paper assignment just picking a issue with drugs and writing about it. Then in the second, in the second, um, in the second column it says live stream. That way you will know which week that you're going to do the live stream. Okay? Don't make it hard. It's all right there. All right? No, 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 you're, you're welcome. And you too, Richie. I mean, it's just, you know, it's just so hard to continuously answer these questions over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. Then someone says, you know, what about... It's like, oh my God. So it's not you, trust me. It is It is the structure. It's the structure of the class. Right? Um, and, and I really think that we could have done things a lot differently and that's okay I mean I don't I don't really mind that um, but in any case let me go ahead and I'm gonna take seven more minutes because we're running longer than I had wanted to so when we take a look at common sense and the boundaries that it creates there's also other things that kind of shape the way in which these things realize themselves one and you can go to the video there's a video and I embedded it in your class in the announcements It's called who am I right one of the things that a lot of you put down is is that when we talked about who am I and then the characteristics of someone who's on drugs or in another class uh, the characteristics of someone who's a violent offender we always come back to mental instability mental health they're crazy they're sick these are these kind of things and then we watch on the media shows like um, 48 hours and we look at true crime stories and we look at um, criminal minds and all that here think about it there's a reason we do that and the reason is this is because if we focus on the crazy mind it deflects attention away from people much like us and as long as we're looking at uh, instability here we don't have to change the structures of society because when you said I am a sister I'm a brother and all these kind of things that means that you think in terms of family so at the top of that chart the Who Am I chart, the video that's six minutes long or whatever, it says economic system, political system, or institution, education institution, military institution, which is police, media institutions. 
You take all those institutions working together and they create for us society, right? So those institutions shape the context in which we interact. Then coming from the institutions are the opportunity structures. Your relationship to the opportunity structures have a direct impact on what happens in your life, whether you become fully successful, whether you turn to drugs, whether you become a violent offender, or whether you're offended. It has a lot to do with the social relationship that you have to the opportunity structure. Emerging from the opportunity structure is your social networks, and from that are the small groups, and you can look at the video and see it. And those small groups shape you, because the interaction that you have with people is the thing that helps you define where you are and where you're going to go. So here's what we have. What we have is, and here's actually a picture of it, I don't know if you can see that. It's in the video, right? Society up here, opportunity structure, networks, uh, small groups, and then here's you down here. Where are you? You're here. And this is your interaction context. The context in which you interact is shaped by institutional forces. But your decision to engage in a behavior is based upon your interaction with other people. Here's why all this is important. Because if our common sense says lethal violence comes at the hand of street offenders, because when we say murder, rape, robbery, we're talking about the street. Well, if we're going to talk about lethal violence, that is firearm related violence, then our policies are always, almost always directed towards the urban inner city, right? So last year, there were about 16,500 people that got murdered in America, 70% with firearms, which makes about 11 or 12,000. But here's the issue. If we're worried about firearms and lethality, then we have to take into account that there are 33, 34,000 suicides, of which the majority were with firearms. Of which, the majority, the, the highest rate of suicide were for white males between the ages of 45 and 54. But what we see on the news when it comes to homicide is young African American inner city men. Right? But the fact of the matter is the most lethally violent people in society are white Anglo-Saxons, 45 to 54. They're the ones who kill themselves most often. So the question is, <coughs> sucker, why do we then... Why do then we focus all of our emphasis on crime control and lethal violence in the inner city when the fact of the matter is the most dangerous people in society just happen to be the white male, right? They're certainly not defined that way, but if we even take a look at who owns and controls corporations and who's the most exploitative um, group in, in the world, it is white males who own and control and operate the international corporations. More people die working for us than they do be getting killed in the street. So why is it we take a look away from what the facts and the matters are? And the reason is because our common sense says to look at the urban inner city. It does not say to look at white males killing themselves. So if we really want to do something about lethal violence, we'd have to redefine the way we look at everything. And as long as we say it has to do with mental health, the reason why people engage in drug addiction, that allows us to look away from persons who have power and control. Because if you really want to see who's killing people, where did the opioid addiction come from? 84,000 people died last year from opioid addiction. Are you serious? And why? Because the pharmaceutical companies addicted such a huge part of the population. And when they put the controls on the distribution of prescription drugs, people found other ways to get the narcotics, the opioids. And because of that replacement coming from, and it was genius by the cartels, right? The cartels started telling their drug traffickers, rather than just selling um, um, crystal meth, and rather than just selling marijuana and cocaine, boy, give them some free samples of this heroin. Give them some free samples of um, the different opioids that addict or that, that are out there and let them become addicted to it. Give it to them for free. When they become addicted to it, then all of a sudden, just start selling it to them. So now all of a sudden, it was our own system of legalized drugs that created the very addiction that is killing 76, 80,000 people a year. Why are we looking at the pharmaceuticals? Because the same group that kills themselves is the same group that runs those corporations. So it's easier for us to use the common sense from the media and politicians to focus our crime efforts on those who are poor, those who are minority, who can't defend themselves against the institutions, rather than looking at and flipping it so we reconstruct our education system, our political system, our, our, our system of criminal justice to reflect it on who's the greatest threat. That's a lot of shit, baby.
That's a lot of stuff that I just threw at you. And the reason why it works this way is because while you were being socialized your whole entire life, you and I were being taught that this is the normal way to think. Right? It's called phenomenology. All the phenomena that we use to define the way in which this world operates, we internalized it. Right? And when we internalized it, we started to find the world as we see it, not for the way we don't. And then, according, oh, here, here's a theory for it. It's called phenom analogy, right? All the phenomena define us. And then what we do is we learn to create categories to define people as a threat or not a threat, and that is called ethnomethodology, right? Ethnomethodology essentially is this idea that we construct boundaries, categories, so that we can define people and then treat them as different, or treat them as a threat or treat them as a friend, right? But we use categories to do it. If you walk into a classroom and you think the person sitting next to you is a violent uh, street gang member who's willing to blow you up at any given moment, you may not go to that class, right? But if you assume that the person you're sitting next to is a student, then you're more likely to go to class when the fact is they may be a gang member because I've had tons of gang members in my class and drug traffickers in my classes. Here's what it all comes down to. Common sense is constructed. It doesn't exist in and of itself. Right? And in that construction, we are taught not to critically assess what we see. And I'm going to give you one last thing. Dang it, I didn't mean to go this long. I apologize, everybody. Here's what we do. When we don't critically assess the world around us, we become followers to a system that was created to contextualize us. And here's what the outcome is. You are living through the greatest change in human history. The greatest change ever. And rather than us preparing you for the greatest change, we're making you into followers. And so as these trends with artificial intelligence and robotics and politics and all this, as this takes us down this road, we know for a statistical fact that 40% of you are going to have to be self-employed by the year 2040. It might be even be higher now. Right now it's only 3%. So if you're being trained in a transactional world, when you need to be thinking transformatively, then you're always going to be behind, and you're always going to be run over by the whims of the institutions. And here's why I'm a transformative teacher. Because if you begin to believe and know that you are great, and you learn how to see how these trends are going to affect you, you can get off the track and get on a different track for your life and you can develop a plan that's different than other people you know it is really important because I understand you're in college you need to know when things are due you need to know how long they are you need to know what kind of format you're doing especially for other instructors for me here's what you need to do you need to think for yourself and in thinking for yourself you're going to come away with a power that is far more important than the concepts in that book 90 95% of the concepts in that book you will forget by the end of the semester and by the time you graduate you might remember one or two percent right but if you can learn some skills of how to critically assess and how to do personal inventory and how to understand your greatness if you can't look in the mirror and say I like you I love you you're worthy of your dreams you're gonna get run down so I'm trying to produce out of you the top five percent of our nation and that is those people who are gonna grab it grab the opportunities as they see necessary and they're going to make something great happen. And I believe that all of you have that greatness with inside you. All of you. And our problem is, is we haven't taught you how to do it. My job, I'm getting older. As you can see, I'm a little crankier than I used to be. But my passion for what happens to you has not changed. And when I look back 20, 25 years from now, I want you to write me, assuming I'm still alive, and say, you know what, it made a lot of sense. You changed my life. And I won't change your life by making you memorize what social disorganization theory is. It won't happen. But if I teach you how to critically think because you learn how to write and articulate yourself. Oh, by the way, last thing. Here's why you're in college. The last thing. One is to learn how to communicate effectively. Right? So as you find yourself in opportunity situations, opportune situations, you got to be able to effectively communicate at that level. The second reason why you're here is so you can become a critical thinker. The third reason why you're here 
in college is so that you can develop your networks, your personal networks. Because laying in your networks is your access to the opportunity structures. And here's what drives me crazy. You come into classrooms when they're live and you start hitting these buttons and texting people that you already freaking know. Well, if you're stuck or you're upset or you're angry or whatever, you're texting the people that are keeping you in that position. Your job is to kick the people off your team that hold you down, kick the people off your team that, um, that insult you, that hurt you, that say, what are you wearing that for? Who are you going out with? You better be with me. If you're not with me, no one can ever be with you. If you, if you got those kind of people on your team, get them off your team. And if you can't do it yourself, you call me. I'll help you get out of that. The other thing is, if, if, they're, if they don't have the ambition that you have, put them on the bench. Doesn't mean you have to dislike them. Put them on the bench. You are the average of the five people that you spend the most time with. And if none of them have ambition, all they want to do is smoke dope and get some green, next, guess what? That's going to rub off on you. Not necessarily the dope smoking, but the, but the drive, right? And here it is. Build your team with people that believe in you. Build your team with people that edify you. Build your team with people who will stand by you, even if your idea is crazy. And then finally, just remember, you're going to need emotional support. you got to get those people on your team. Financial support. Get those people on your team. Spiritual support. Psychological support. Build your team. You build your team, and you perfect your communication skills, and know that you're great and worthy of your dreams, and there's going to be magic in your life. And Roxana, Richie, Charlie, Raydell, Jonathan, that's all I want for you. At this point in my life, all I want is for you to succeed. Let me see by a show of hands. You all understand where I'm coming from? Was this discussion tonight worthy? of your time, even if you're not in this class officially. Was it worth your time? Let me just say yes or no. And if you, uh, all right, Roxanne, I, I do apologize to you if I came off a little strong. Cool, all right, Jonathan, thank you. Amy, wait a minute, where'd you come from? Hold on a second, gotta get your name down. All right, good, Paul, Margalita, thank you. Okay, that's how we're gonna do it. We're gonna build on your uh, greatness, Silva, Silva. Oh, let me put you in this attendance. Let me get you in this attendance. All right, Carolina. Te Kevin, Kevin. Oh, yeah, that's right. You gave me yours already. Let me see here. Where's my... All right, Edgar. Wait, I, I got you, Edgar, didn't I? I got you. Narcotics. Where'd you go? Where'd you go, Aria Rosa? Amy Silva. There we go. Make sure you're here. Well, let me just say, you all are awesome. Don't let my momentary slip-ups be anything but momentary slip-ups because at the end of the day, I do care what happens to you. And I'm at the twilight of my career and all I'm thinking about is being a motivational speaker, um, helping people obtain their greatness. I want to sell these books. By the way, Hope Works will be out. Get it for yourself. Get it for others. I'd certainly appreciate the support. Uh, get other people to subscribe. Bring friends with you to the next class. And I will see you in two weeks. If you have an assignment to do next week. And Richie, I am going to start um, over the weekend. I'm going to start grading because I just don't, I definitely don't need like this tidal wave of being behind. I just it's so much to manage. It's just it's no easier for me than it is for you all. But we're all in the same boat. My job is to get you to the finish line. But in getting you to the finish line, I want two things to happen. I want you to become a great writer, and I want you to be in control of your life. You do those two things, baby, sky's the limit. Well, I got to go to the restroom. Got to change his hat, put my Buckeye hat on because we're heading to the weekend. Ohio State's going to play this season, so Clemson, beware. Um, you all were terrific. And please, continue to ask questions. Don't let, you know, my frustration uh, hinder you in any way. This is your class. Um, I'm going to take a couple days off, but, um, baby, I'm going to make some things happen. You've been terrific. If there are no more questions, I'm going to sign off of here and wish you a delicious weekend and a fantastic week. Um, watch that announcement board, and we're going to make some great things happen. Take care, everybody.